Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to everybody. It is such a pleasure and it's such an honor for me to welcome you to the 10th biennial Isaac Words Plus Outstanding Consumer Lecture. It's hard to believe for 20 years we have been doing this and we have a really extraordinary legacy. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to give you a little bit of information about the lecture, how it's come about, and our very rich history. Walt and Ginger Waltos, the founders of Words Plus, back in the late 80s and early 90s, recognized as more and more people who use augmentative communication were presenting at conferences and were public speaking, that there was a trend that many people were paying attention to and most interested in what technology were they using? What strategies were they using? And what was eclipsed was who the person is there was very little focus on who the person is and what their message is. And so Walt and Ginger realized that there was a real need to have a platform for a person who uses augmentative communication to present and have it not be about augmentative communication. Have it not be about my experience with AAC or how AAC has changed my life or my life with a disability, or overcoming hardships with a disability. And absolutely, every one of those topics is important and critical. But they saw that there's a need for more, for people to see the talents, the expertise, the scholarly endeavors, the interests and opinions of someone who, who, with broad social significance. And because of that, they founded the Isaac Words Plus Outstanding Consumer Lecture, or the Words Plus Isaac Outstanding Consumer Lecture. So the process is that there are submissions solicited from the membership, the review guidelines, and the call for submissions is published uh, in a number of different places. And now that we have such a, a rich history of previous presenters, up to four former presenters of the Words Plus Isaac Consumer Lecture are, 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 are judges and reviewers. This year, we had 14 submissions from seven countries. And, by the way, in addition to this platform, there is a cash award of 5,000 US dollars uh, for the, the recipient of this, this award. So I want to very quickly go through our rich legacy. It, must, it used to be much, it was shorter, but now we've had so many phenomenal speakers. So starting in 1992, Mick Joyce lectured, talked about finding love and relationships in the 20th century. Paul Marshall in 94, values of faith and family. Michael Williams in 1996, literacy and education, a foundation to success. Meredith Allen, in 1998, spoke on feminism, language, and culture. Heather Rose Slattery, in 2000, spoke about her experience writing and then starring in a very provocative film honored at the Cannes Film Festival. Solomon Rockman, in 2002, talked about the opportunity in a communistic versus a democratic governance. Sayamdad Mukherjee, in 2004, discussed spirituality realized through nature, especially through his experiences in the mountains. Yusun Chung, in 2006, talked about motherhood as the greatest achievement in life. India Oaks, in 2008, discussed social justice in to be or not to be, using our rights and supporting our world. And in our last conference, Thor Sandmel, in 2010, discussed the philosophy of mathematics. I am so honored to introduce to you today Lisa Lehman in her topic of intimacy as a human need. Thank you.
Well, hello, Pittsburgh. Hello, Isaac members. Are you still awake? Last session of the second day. Hope you are all still energized. Can I get a hello? Can I hear you scream? Make some noise. Any way you can be heard. Wow! Now that's what I am talking about. Are you awake now? Hopefully you are. Thanks, John, for the introduction, and thanks for this opportunity to talk to a subject I am very passionate about. My style of presenting is very informal and could best be described as delivering messages through storytelling. I begin by recognizing the people who cannot be here today, and I dedicate this paper to those in a less fortunate place. I do this in the hope that the world can one day be barrier-free with love, acceptance, and peace. I also acknowledge those who have gone before us in fighting the good fight in creating real and valued lifestyles for themselves, their loved ones, and humanity. Okay so this is where I should insert some disclaimers, I am not the most politically correct person, so if I do offend anyone, I truly do not mean to. I was raised in a very free-thinking, loud and proud family, and community environment. I respect the views of others, as I wish my views to be respected. We are all human, and while we don't have to agree on everything we must respect the choices and personal values of ourselves and each other. I am not an academic, nor do I wish to be, although I am in my second year of a double degree in business management and psychology. I speak today with intrinsic expert knowledge from what I consider rich life experiences and extrinsic or learned knowledge on right, relationships, intimacy as a need but ignored as a human rights issue. Okay, so first I will give you a brief snapshot of who I am. Then I will speak to the need for right relationships in people's lives with competing human needs. I will then talk to the historical and political oppression of sexuality and the very legitimate need for human intimacy on both a spiritual and physical level. Yes people I've used the S word. I guess that means another my political perspective. I proudly align with the values and policy of the Australian Sex Party, one of the fastest growing political parties in Australia. So again if I offend you, truly I don't mean to. So I am going to be speaking from my own experiences, which will mean exposing some of my little secrets. There goes my memoirs, or maybe this will be the preface to them. But in speaking from my own experiences, I hope people can relate, and also realize their own inner gods or goddesses, or even just allow yourself the authority to entertain your most intimate desires. Okay. So I am a 30-something single mum. I live my life on the principle that every choice we make we make for the journey, we are meant to travel in this lifetime. There are no wrong choices because our choices lead to the lessons we need to learn and the path we are meant to travel. 
I feel my lived experiences have given me the foundations and lessons I have needed to realize my purpose. But to step back a bit, I am the youngest of four and was raised with the same allowances, rules, and boundaries as my siblings. I had comparable average childhood experiences with puppy love, secrets, and expressing my undying love on many occasions to many a boy. When I was five I have a vivid memory of my brother catching a family friend's son, who was my age peck me on the cheek, and my brother proudly exclaiming Max and Lisa are now boyfriend and girlfriend, innocent, but precious memories. I grew up mostly in rural areas, and smaller communities just tend to kind of take care of their own and embrace all. I refer to myself as the runt of the litter, because my dad grew up on the land and I always recall him saying, it might have been born a runt but that lamb, or calf, or dog, whatever animal he was referring to, will be the strongest willed of them all. So I identify with the fight for survival, fight for recognition, and strength of character in a runt. I was born with juvenile arthritis so I always knew of physical barriers, but the largest ones, I think, are the attitudinal barriers. And so from a young age I learned to present myself with dignity and courage. I was always developing my own sense of style and counteracting societal perceptions. I could actually speak until I was 13 when I had a stroke. Although I have been non-verbal for over two-thirds of my life, I still refer to my life in two parts. B.S. Before the stroke, I had aspirations of becoming an actress. I was a full-spirited average teenage girl with two things on my mind, boys, and big dreams. I was outspoken, outgoing, and outspoken again. A.S. After the stroke, my body frustrated me. I still felt and thought the same but could no longer express it verbally. So emotionally I let it all out and mourn the loss of my speech for a while. But then life was still going to keep going, and slowly I began living it again. When I returned to school I was seen as even more different in a less cool. No longer able to communicate verbally I was disregarded as a viable student and placed into the special ed unit of the school with no lesson planning, other than to vegetate. Of course my mum and I fought this decision but I was no longer perceived as the same intelligent young girl I still was inside. In the end we moved towns from country Queensland to the urbanized Sunshine Coast, so I could go to a mainstream school, and be challenged intellectually as I had always been. I finished high school in year 10, and did two years study at the equivalent of community college and obtained an associate diploma of fashion studies. I need to say I am not a very strategic person in that my life hasn't been planned or formulated, it's just happened. As John Lennon once said, life is what happens while you are busy making other plans. I made choices and did stupid things. 
When I was at college I had big plans of moving to Sydney to pursue my fashion career. But that just never happened as I made decisions that took my life on a different path, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but all with great lessons and personal growth. I grew up a bit and got a real job working in a government department, and also did some study in different areas that interested me. I fell pregnant in 2006, no that wasn't planned either. I will always be a dreamer, but I have become a realist too with age. I now have life and career goals I want to achieve. Which brings us back to why I am at university if I have no desire to be an academic. When people ask me what field I am aiming to work in I reply with the standard spiel I have developed since realizing my purpose. I say, well, I am only here for the piece of paper to give me the perceived credibility to pursue my business plan in a fairly controversial industry. I feel I need academic qualifications purely to advance my credibility on a business and societal level. I will explain more about my long-term business goals later. Over the last two decades I have been involved in formal advocacy, and regard myself as a fairly decent activist on speaking about having the right balance of natural, paid, unpaid, formal and informal relationships in the lives of people with disability. Before I stumbled on advocacy, I was just a rebel without a cause in many ways. I just want to share a clip, and if I could have told my 14-year-old self this, wowie what a difference it would have made. So you youths in the audience, take note, these are mostly Australian comedians so it may not translate very well but the key message should come through. The clip was made for the youth suicide campaign related to sex discrimination but it translates to all marginalized groups. Red suburban, red brick town, and I grew up thinking everyone was uh, mostly straight, everyone was Catholic, and everyone, uh, everyone's dad played for the football teams that we all supported, because two of my best friends' dads played for the football teams they supported, so I assumed that my dad also played for Collingwood. He didn't, uh, not even close. Uh, hey, it's um, H Hannah Gadsby here. Yep, mm. uh, here, here to just tell, tell you all, it, it gets better. Not this video, it's probably going to just keep the same trajectory, but just life in general, it gets better. I know that uh, being young can be hard. I know that people can be horrible, and I know that school can suck. I was at home on my computer. Um, I might not have been on it yet. I might have been waiting for the MS-DOS to boot up. Um, but my sister, I felt my sister behind me, and she kind of, uh, she was, was sniffling. I looked around, and she was crying, and she said, um, I've I got to tell you something. I'm, I'm gay. Uh, and I just hugged her. I know that it must be even harder if you think because of your sexuality you're somehow a bit different or a bit weird. I know that tragically suicide rates are disproportionately high amongst young gay kids. Hi, my name's Kate McLennan and it does get better. I was lonely and scared and different and that's not fun. My nickname in high school was Brickhead, um, given to me by a boy called Damien, because uh, he thought that I'd look like I'd run into a brick wall, uh, which was nice. But now he's kind of bald and quite overweight and actually stacks bricks for a living. So swings and roundabouts, kids, swings and roundabouts. There's some guys that might go on Facebook or they might go on the internet and write some stuff about you. Personally, 
I think people should be IQ tested then allocated a certain font. And I think we'd all know then most bullies would be riding in windings. Pretty early on I realised that I was different to the other people that I grew up with. I was interested in different things to them. I was fascinated by different things to them. I didn't want to have the same conversations that they were having. But of course, when you're a teenager, you don't want to be different. You want to fit in. You want to be like everybody else. That's the thing that makes it better. Like the first time that you you realise that you like have the capacity to love somebody um, rather than just kind of faking it through relationships with people. And when you can look at somebody and see see them as wonderful and have them do that back to you, ah, that's a, it. Will be a shame. <laughs> for anybody to miss out. In your life that really loves you, um, you telling them you're gay or bisexual or whatever it is, isn't going to matter to them because the only thing that they'll want is you in, you in their lives and um, they won't want to lose you. I mean, for you right now, things might be a bit shit. Uh, things are going to be shit, very shit, super, super duper shit. But you know what, that doesn't mean that necessarily for the rest of your life things are going to stay shit. And in this world, to be different sometimes means to be discriminated against. And if you're part of a minority, you can be put in danger and you can be marginalised. Don't let them get you down because you're a good person, you're a unique person and you have a lot to give. And I spent a lot of time thinking that maybe things would be better if I wasn't around. But then I realised that there wasn't just that small town, that there's, there's the rest of the world. School, primary, high school, wherever you're at, it's a blip in your life. It's a, it's a dip, it's a small hump. In high school, you're just there because these are kids of the same age from the same area. You mightn't have the same interests, but as you get older, you're gonna find people that do have the same interests as you and they make you feel comfortable about yourself. So that's why you need to be tough and tough in the You need to be brave and you need to be proud of who you are. So just make sure that you talk to people, anyone, because even though what you're experiencing is unique and what every individual experiences is unique, there will be little things that you'll be able to relate to. When I was growing up, when I, when I was growing up, when I was a little, little boy, I would uh, go into my mother's room and open up a cupboard and try on a high heel shoes and then wander around the house in them. And she'd say, where's, where's, take those darn things off your dad's coming down the driveway. And then things just got better because Ellen came out. Uh, that's that helped. Uh, so thanks Ellen. Uh, stop dancing. Times are a little bit different. Uh, things have changed. I still do wear high heel shoes on stage to dress up parties just when I'm doing the gardening, really. Uh, the difference is no one really cares now. No one really gives a shit. Um, which can be a problem because I'm kind of missing the attention. The most interesting people in life are not the ones who fit in. The most interesting people in life, the people who change the world, are the different people. So don't be afraid of being different. Embrace being different because one day you're going to want to surround yourself by the most exciting people in the world, the different people. And that's why I'm here to say to you, from my heart, it gets better. It does get better. It just so, keeps yes. getting better. It definitely gets better. Life gets easier as you get older. It gets better. It gets better. In fact, it gets amazing. It can get amazing, so just, just hang in there. Swings and roundabouts are a given in life. Everyone has some kind of formal or professional relationships, from massage therapists to bank manager. Granted your bank manager doesn't wipe your butt, and a massage therapist doesn't brush your teeth. But these formal relationships assist in functional daily living. Many people believe that people with a disability particularly need specialist care. Based on the language used in describing human needs as special needs. No one's needs are more special than anyone else's. Everyone just has different levels of needs throughout their lifetime. From infancy to end of life planning, we need tender, loving and bonding relationships, and we develop all types of relationships throughout our lifetime. 
This has been identified in studies from early investigations of psychology. As early as René Spitz in 1935 who investigated the impact of long-term institutional care of infants. Spitz made his assessment through his observations of behavior in both sterile and more homely simulated settings. Noting the deterioration of behavior in the sterile environment and the importance of infant and mother figure bond in the more homely environment, his studies indicated when a child is deprived of intimacy for longer than five months they show the symptoms of increasing deterioration. Spitz referred to this deprivation of regular nurturance as hospitalism. Later John Bowlby developed attachment theory, whose most important tenet is that an infant needs to develop a relationship with at least one primary caregiver for social and emotional development to occur normally. My son Hunter was born 11 weeks premature, so I didn't get to hold him for a week. Our first kangaroo cuddle was such a bonding experience, and from that time his progress increased rapidly, and he was home a month before his due date. Through having my own child, and watching his development, as he intrinsically gained values, morals, behaviors, reflexes and strength, or recognition of weaknesses of character, gained from the village we are raised in. It does after all take a literal or metaphorical village with exposure to diverse characters to raise well-adjusted children to adulthood. So, I am here today to talk more to the recognition of sex and intimacy, as a human right which drives healthy sexual development, throughout one's lifetime. As a human right, it is also the right for every person to choose, to experience this necessary piece of healthy development and not be limited only to people who are considered the most desirable, or seen as more socially skilled. Intimacy rights are not limited to those who are seen, in mainstream and popular culture as, aesthetically perfect. One of the basic instincts, of every living being is the need for intimacy. Skin hunger theory is an extension of the nurturance needed throughout one's lifetime, as earlier discussed in attachment theory. The Urban Dictionary, I know not a very credible source, but I view it as a realistic description, defines skin hunger as when you are lying in bed or sitting on a park bench and begin fantasizing about just holding another person, and not thinking about sex. That's skin hunger. Real and sensual touch as opposed to clinical care touch, even informal caregivers can sometimes not provide the level of intimate touch that satisfies skin hunger. I want to acknowledge not everyone has the desire to be sexually active, but it is human nature to want to connect with another, whether it be a lifelong companion, or a best friend, who knows almost all your secrets, as Hitchcock once said. I have a feeling, inside me somewhere, there's someone no one else knows about. No one can truly know your needs better than yourself, and having people in your life to assist, and facilitate meeting these needs, in a non-judgmental way, will assist in keeping people safe, 
and encouraging human development. Tina Sellers, a religious scholar, states that ancient religious texts celebrated sex and sensuality, and the shaming and mythology of sin related to sexuality has only been introduced by modern society. The prohibition of sensuality and sexuality has only really occurred in the last 300 or so years. This speaks to the oppression of people using guilt, shame, and threats of harm or impurity. Being a social outcast, or being seen as depraved, because one wants to explore their personal self, is as a result of the need, for authority of approval, to be acceptable in society. To quote an ancient translated text, sexual desire is not evil, but must be satisfied in the proper time, place and manner. From a modern historical perspective sexual expression has been viewed either clinically or as socially shameful behavior. In the Victorian era, women were treated for hysteria, literally translated as womb disease. It was seen as a medical need to treat an attack or outburst of a particular emotion by medically administered stimulation of the genitalia. It was identified as most beneficial for widows, those who live chaste lives, and female religious figures. It was however, not recommended for very young women, or public women, and was especially not recommended for married women for whom it was seen a better remedy to engage in intercourse with their spouses. This kind of treatment occurred right up until the mid-1900s, and female hysteria was one of the most frequently diagnosed diseases in history, until the American Psychiatric Association officially removed the hysteria and neurasthenic disorders from modern disease paradigms in 1952. Still sexuality remained possibly the most taboo subject in society, and even today we see discrimination of workers based on their profession. The most misunderstood, but arguably the oldest profession, is still forced to the margin of society and although tainted with a poor image, its fascination still draws attention. I just want to clarify, the term public woman, is a historical term given to someone who is paid to provide intimate physical contact. The negative images in society of this industry promote the use of inappropriate labeling, and I really hope you leave with some insight into the discrimination people who engage in this work face. A sex worker, as the profession, is known in contemporary language, is as legitimate to providing a clinical, yet intimate service, as a massage therapist. I am assuming there are many care-based professionals in the audience. How would you handle the discrimination of your industry, based on the fact you are paid to touch people in an intimate, albeit clinical way? We all have a degree of pre-programming and embedded morality from our upbringing, and almost all of us have at one stage or another fallen for the romanticized Hollywood dramatic fair of sex workers. From Moulin Rouge, to Pretty Woman, we see the workers portrayed as victims trapped in the industry, as a result of an abusive childhood or drug addiction, or who need rescuing from a menacing pimp. When in reality, 
The majority of workers in this industry are moral citizens, just like any other industry. In hindsight I feel ripped off. I had always believed that Prince Charming would come along for everyone, and was raised with the old school motto that there is the one for everyone. But it's okay for us to sow our wild oats in the pursuit of that one. My relationship experiences have on the whole been pretty positive. I had the middle school, puppy love crushes, and rebelled with my girlfriends and the boys in the first year of high school, and then the medical disaster happened, and put a new barrier in my evolution to womanhood. It may have slowed me down a little, it obviously didn't stop me totally. Mum always says, the universe knew what it was doing to challenge me, in other ways, because I would have been dangerous. I became sexually active at 18, and had always been taught safe sex and personal health hygiene, having two older sisters. I had always been included and treated as just one of the girls when it came to all things girly and sexual exploration was seen as a rite of passage into womanhood. I have had a few meaningful relationships, and don't regret any of my history as it led me to realize that it is kind of unique to have such. I am going to use that dreaded word normative experiences for someone labeled by society as disabled. I began to witness people with disability being labeled predatory, perverted, or seen as innocents. I had a kind of aha moment when I was thinking about this labeling all because they have needs and desires that are being completely overlooked. This brings me back to why I am at university. I began formulating a business plan in my mind around addressing independent socialization needs for people with disability, who may require assistance for personal functions, such as drinking, eating, or relieving themselves. My business plan has three parts to it, which all stem from the original belief that building informal relationships, intimacy and for some people, sex, is a human need not for the privileged few of society's most admired. Denial or ignorance of this human need can lead to the manifestation of what is deemed as inappropriate behavior. The first part is to establish a mainstream burlesque style inspired nightclub where staff are trained in providing services to patrons with various degrees of ability. The club will be marketed as a mainstream nightclub but inclusive of people with disability, who want to be able to socialize independently of formal paid support workers. This will facilitate self-directed socialization, and autonomy for many people. Think about it from your own experiences. If all of your social experiences had necessitated an informed chaperone, imagine the benefit of such a venue that can effectively and appropriately support people to have autonomy with social connectedness. The second part is to establish on-site sexual services for individuals, intimate assistance for couples, or just a private safe space to share with a new friend in an attempt to cater for most situations. This will fill the needs of many people, who live in shared home setting, or with parents, 
where the opportunity to develop meaningful encounters exists, but going home with a partner might not be an option. If you are feeling uneasy about this, remember that the life circumstances of many people do not allow them to have the traditional opportunity for intimacy, and without an appropriate venue, the only option is to deny many people this basic human right and need. The third part is envisaged to be in home. Services run from the club where the safety and satisfaction of the client is assured through worker training and recognizing that some people for whatever reason will just want the professionalism of a sex worker. I have always been interested, but also apprehensive of exploring the industry as a career, due to the attached stigma and darkness society casts it into. In my pursuit for knowledge, I have not identified any mainstream accessible club that offers the kinds of services required as I have identified previously. There are a few organizations that were developed to assist people with disability link with sex workers, trained in servicing clients with disability, but as a holistic approach to normalized socialization, independence, and intimacy needs, I am yet to find else close to my vision. Search into the industry, I have discovered the commonalities of discrimination experienced by both people with disability and professional practicing sex workers worldwide. Currently there are only two examples of full decriminalization, with regulated industry standards worldwide. With many extreme examples of discriminatory laws worldwide, portraying consenting adults as helpless victims, it highlights a lack of societal understanding and sees discriminatory laws imposed on all parties. Workers in the industry advocate openly for reforms and promote the need for full decriminalization with recognized industry standards. In my journey of exploring the industry, I discovered a number of documentaries highlighting the unjust laws inhibiting industry standards. A new Australian documentary piqued my interest based on sex worker, Rachel Watton, whose life and profession has become the subject of a documentary currently making the international circuit at the film festivals. I was fortunate enough to catch one of its first premieres and hear Rachel speak on a panel after the airing. I want to share with you today the trailer to the film, then I will break some myths of sex workers, by quoting Rachel from recent interviews and subsequent articles, as well as perspectives from other stakeholders. So here is the documentary trailer to Scarlet Road. I do not have a girlfriend, so I cannot share my feelings with just one person. Rachel makes me feel like I have a girlfriend. I like the fact that my job always entails pleasure, making someone feel better about themselves. They deserve to smile. It's hard because with your other kids you don't have anything to do with their sex lives. Mark needed that little bit of help. Rachel sees them as people but she sees them as people that want to explore themselves to the fullest. Yes, he had good muscles. I would like him to lose his virginity. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> it's completely legal for a sex worker to come here. You can order in like a pizza. People with disability want connection, intimacy and touch. I think they do with you tonight. 
people don't want to talk to me about sex. They just want to know where they can get it. <laughs> Tonight's really important. I haven't got much movement below the knee to be able to achieve normal sexual function when you think yourself incapable of it. I feel like a real bloke again. These are people that very often has, for a long time, never been touched. Everybody needs to have somebody to hold hands with. Sexuality and sexual expression is a, the last bastion. It has been my dream to have the woman stay in my bed overnight. Everyone has a right to sexual expression, and that includes people with disability. The trailer starts with Mark stating Rachel makes him feel like he is a girlfriend, and through the course of the film Mark unpacks his statement saying he realizes it is a profession, but the confidence and self-awareness gained through his encounters with Rachel allow him to experience natural and intimate touch. Rachel states that she likes the fact that her job helps people feel better about themselves. Rachel and many other sex workers have begun to speak out and in doing so have begun to bust myths and societal perceptions of sex workers as victims, immoral, and second-class citizens. To quote Rachel, People have such a black ideology about who is involved in the sex industry and what's involved. She says she always tries to normalize what it is and makes industry comparisons. Also comparing it to mainstream practices, people are going to bars and going online to dating and pickup sites to get a date and to have sex. She goes on to say, no one cares about who is or is not using a condom. And certainly no one cares to monitor if anyone at the bars, and clubs and online, is ever getting an sexually transmitted disease checkup. Rachel goes on to point out people get their knickers in a twist, and feel that they have the right to talk about you, based on your profession. This is purely because of the lack of understanding about the industry. Rachel states, People forget that we are part of the general public. We are parents at parent and citizen meetings. We are your neighbors. We are someone's son and daughter. We are sitting next to you in the cinema, or buying milk at the corner store. Only when sex is discussed as a business transaction, Having a clear discussion about safe practices, and negotiating what the worker will, and will not do, with the potential client, and a monetary value is put on the exchange, society sent into a tailspin. In the spirit of the famous Simpsons line by Helen Lovejoy, won't someone please think of the children? To this I respond, as a parent, I protect my child, I put safeguards in place to ensure his safety. I expect society to respect my choice in teaching him the values and morals of equality, and not to merely judge, based on our own pre-programming. In one light society views sex workers as victims, and in another light, the profession is seen as predatory to all vulnerable groups. This also speaks to the perception that people with limited or no perceived means of communication have an inability to consent, and as such are seen as needing constant protection from all people 
who don't know the individual. I again heard Rachel speak to this in the sense it's like any other therapeutic service in that the clients, with intellectual and other neuro conditions affecting informed decision making, are introduced to the worker over a period of time, and most often, is initiated by the people who truly know the individual. Every human needs safeguards in their lives, but in my experience the biggest safeguard is to have people in your life who truly know and understand people's triggers and emotional ability, and who truly have the person's best interests at heart. People who truly know the individual act as facilitators to make this life as joyful as possible. It also speaks to the professionalism of the sex worker. Most take their work and training quite seriously, and would not jeopardize their career or reputation by forcing an act on someone where the person is not responding with satisfaction. Again, I reiterate intimacy needs are not purely sexual. It could be as simple as needing a regular hug from people with whom the person feels safe and secure. But again, every human deserves the right to assistance to understand their own feelings and growth on a level comprehensible the individual. In the case of adults with disability who are fully able to consent, I reflect on my own experiences. In talking to an ex-lover about this, and if he felt it was ever an issue, his response simplified the subject to one statement. Body language speaks louder than words in intimate situations. Rachel who also has a Bachelor of Psychology, and has started a Master's in Sexual Health, is co-founder on an organization that has been active since 2000, Touching Base. Touching Base developed out of the need to assist people with disability and sex workers to connect with each other, focusing on access discrimination, human rights, and legal issues, and the attitudinal barriers that these two marginalized communities face. Touching Base has developed a number of training workshops around awareness of various disabilities and numerous other resources for all stakeholders. A network in the UK was established around 2002, called TLC, with a similar scope. Another article I read recently from a worker's perspective speaks to the intimate nature of the work, and offers a pertinent industry comparison. The article was addressing myths, aptly named Sex Work 101. The writer states the sex I have at work is work. For me it is not comparable to the sex I have for pleasure with my partner. That doesn't mean I never enjoy it. The writer goes on to compare it to working in a childcare center, looking after other people's kids all day, I might enjoy it. I might like those kids, and care for them but it is very different to how I feel when I care for my own child. It is just a service, an intimate service yes, but there are many jobs, where people provide intimate services for money, such as child care. I find this comparison justifiable as we are advised to make our careers in something we enjoy, and can make a living from. 
Why then is sex and the practice of selling sex still so frowned upon? It comes back to mainstream and societal norms. We are raised to conform to heterogeneous norms and follow mainstream ideology or organic roots. From birth we are programmed into gender based on biological makeup seen on the outside. Over the last decade real change has occurred in recognizing same-sex unions. I am not going to touch on this very deeply as it's a whole subject on its own. However I do raise it to point out that since President Obama came out in support of same-sex unions, and recognition of diverse family units. Public approval rates had risen in the states by about 5%. This speaks to the authority of approval, and as humans, we often oppress our own beliefs for the perceived greater good until given the approval by someone of authority to accept our own oppressed values. One man's personal opinion expressed publicly has had an enormous and what I see as positive influence on world acceptance of diversity. But then the gatekeeper models are enacted, policies are written, laws are passed and rights removed in the course of protection. As outlined previously where it's perceived a person is vulnerable, society acts as gatekeepers, preventing natural life experiences. I wasn't sure if I would use this clip, as it is a little controversial, but I feel compelled to raise the issue of keeping religion out of modern politics and legislation. Though I do want to point out I am not referring to one's spirituality, I personally believe spirituality is one's respect and appreciation for humanity and should not be confused with religious beliefs or faiths. This ad speaks to my political position on the laws governing our sexual freedoms. In the same sentiment the politics governing laws and legislation are based upon biblical texts and not reflective of modern societal values, the times they must be a-changing. From a socio-economic perspective, giving the industry clear standards where workers are afforded the same rights as any other service industry, and stripping away the stigma, can only benefit society. For there are only three certainties in life, you are born, you pay taxes, and you die. The fact the Australian Tax Office recognizes income made from any ongoing work as taxable income provides some legitimacy to sex work. To quote a recent article the Australian Tax Office doesn't care how you make your money as long as you pay tax on it. However Australia's tax system is a national system 
and sex industry laws are state-based and differ from state to state. This disparity makes it hard for workers to be nomadic or migrant in their working career like many other professions such as nurses. Without recognition of primal instincts and the need for satisfaction, certain demographics will continue to be discriminated against and denied this right. This can be identified across various groups from the elderly to people who live with disability, with societal ignorance of these groups in relation to intimacy needs. My mum has worked in aged care settings most of my life, she tells many stories. My favourite is of a woman, in her nineties who was admitted by her daughter and husband. It was discovered after much investigation by her daughter and staff that this woman was still desiring satisfaction of an adult kind. My mum suggested they organise an overnight stay back in the family home, to which her husband responded, Oh no no, I put her in here for a break. She wanted it so much. I just get so tired. With this information her care team met with the daughter again, and the daughter expressed her mother had asked to buy her an aid to assist the mother in meeting her own needs. Many staff were not in agreement to this, which again comes back to not putting your own personal beliefs and values on to others. The daughter understood her mother's needs, and advocated strongly, and the lady got some satisfaction and relaxation from thereon. Now I am not suggesting or people aging, I ran the old people, but I am saying no matter what setting you live in, whether it be an aged care residential facility, a shared housing situation, or independent living, we are humans first and foremost and our needs must be addressed in a holistic mind, body, and spirit manner. I've used the word perceived, or perceptions a lot, and let's face it, we all perceive things differently, whilst we gravitate to people with similar ideology. Our perceptions are all unique to us. Just don't let your perceptions guide your values unless you know the facts. To close I would like to share with you some quotes. Having started with the runt analogy it reminded me of a manifesto I read a while ago of how the world would be if dogs ruled. And I feel it appropriate to end with the visual quotes from this. You may have noticed I've quoted a few lyrics throughout, and music speaks words sometimes unsaid. So along with the quotes I want to end with an authentically Aussie song by the waves called Flesh and Blood. It speaks to the judgment of differences and the prejudices that people form without seeing the true value of human uniqueness. It speaks to the discrimination sex workers experience in everyday life as outlined in the body of this paper. Whilst clearly identifying similarities in every living being, we are made up of the same matter, flesh and blood, skin and bone. I'm feeling particularly brave, so whilst the song and visuals are playing I am going to exercise my right to freedom of expression and bust some moves. If you so feel inclined, join me in moving to the music, however you feel it. Before I finish this speaking bit I want to share another quote. Courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. 
Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. So that being said, thanks for being courageous enough to listen. And I hope you continue to be courageous by listening to your own mind, body and soul and enjoying the life you strive to have. I also just want to thank my stepdad Jeff, who has taken time out from work to accompany my son and me on this trip, and my beautiful boy Hunter for teaching me so much. Thank you.
I'm Jeff Dolan, president of Words Plus. I greatly appreciate that you all have joined us for today's outstanding consumer lecture and have given me a chance to address you. First, thank you, Lisa, for an interesting and challenging lecture. You've addressed a topic that can be tricky to discuss. I want to thank you for making sure you considered the various sensitivities of such a diverse group of cultures, beliefs, and ages as we represent here today. You are part of the legacy now of this award and to be admired by all device users. Um, and I'm very glad that your son Hunter could be here today to see this. Um, so I'll talk for a minute here, and then afterwards I want to invite device users, our Australian contingent, anybody who'd like to, to come take a picture with Lisa. So thank you to uh, Isaac and this year's organizers for giving us this fine venue to show off the talents of a special member of our community. And a special thanks to John Costello. Uh, Words Plus had a concept for this award 20 years ago, and John stepped forward to shepherd the process. Words Plus gets to read each submission with John and his selection committee to make sure the spirit of the award is upheld, but it is John who coaches each applicant into his best application for the award, and then John who awards the winner, or uh, who works with the winner, the organizers and the audiovisual staff to enable you to connect with that winner. Thank you, John. In terms of that connection with the speaker, technology is the conduit for the person. Lisa is expressing her identity, her expertise, and her opinions. Whether you, or not you're in agreement with her point of view, I'm sure you re reacted far more to her content than to her technology. And this is Words Plus's goal. Since the 80s, we have given high-functioning clients like Lisa full access to consumer technology. We see the industry recognizing more modes of communication than ever, such as email, phone, texting, social media. Uh, insert joke here about uh, Lisa's uh, means of communication. Uh, we've been giving our users full access since the 80s, and sometimes it has been an uphill battle. So we look forward to those barriers falling away as we in the industry all focus on this together. Let's make sure together that new technology for typical consumers does not become a new barrier for our constituents. From the first dynamic display software talking screen to the first dynamic display tablet, Pegasus, Words Plus, continues to make those long-term investments. We're currently working with cell phone makers and carriers to make AT and wireless work better together, especially for modern and future smartphones. And if anybody would like to join us on that, please give me a call. The future of technology is uh, exciting. For our industry and the future of Words Plus is exciting. At, at the end of last year, we joined the Prinky Romic family. After our 30 years of slugging it out with PRC, this represents an exciting merger of the strengths of two of the industry innovation leaders. So I carry greetings from PRC and PRC's congratulations to our winner as well. And uh, Words Plus and PRC will continue the award, so I encourage everybody here to take home the message that you should apply next year. And remember, it's, it's your story, your expertise, your experience, not how AAC changed my life. And now it gives me great pleasure to present the Words Plus Isaac Outstanding Consumer Lecture Award for 2012 to Lisa Lehman. So that concludes our presentation, and uh, again, I invite anybody who'd like to to come take a picture with Lisa. Thank you.